Deci să, să nu ne sfim să fim mândri de Ianis Xenakis, de Brăileanul Ianis Xenakis. Începem. So, uh, today is the 29th of May uh, 2023 and uh, it is our pleasure to talk about a remarkable uh, artist, Ianis Xenakis, born in 1922 and died in 2001. Uh, let's, uh, let's read a little bit about him. But before we, we, we read uh, uh, some, uh, some, uh, some words about uh, his biography, let's contemplate this, this, face, this suffering face, because this man suffered uh, maybe more than most people. Every human being knows suffering, but some suffer more than others. And I think he did suffer. And if you look uh, at his uh, very often, the photographs, of Yanis Xenakis show him with, with the left side of his face in shadow. Why? Because he was disfigured in the Second World War. <clears throat> I don't know exactly what happened, uh, but he had conflicts with the Greek government. He was even placed on a blacklist. He was condemned to death because he was part of a resistance group politically Uh, and uh, yes, he was uh, condemned to death. He had to uh, leave the country. Uh, he was able to, to escape the, 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 you know, the, the tragic uh, um, you know, possibility of, of, of being killed by the very government of Greece and arrived in France. But I will not anticipate. I just want to say that he reminded me a little bit, I mean, You know, there isn't really a connection between Xenakis and Alei Giardino, a remarkable Brazilian um, artist, architect, who um, is not now the time to truly say a lot about Alei Giardino, but I am impressed by, by people who transcend their suffering, who transcend their misfortune, who transcend the tragedy and transform, really, they take revenge On a, on a problematic life through the art. And um, I don't want to be excessively, ex excessively dramatic, but I, I imagine that Yanis Xenakis did suffer a lot, but he was able through the brilliance of his art to arrive at the, at the highest levels. Like Alei Jardinio, Alei Jardinio in Brazil, Alei Jardinio means in Brazilian or Portuguese, the little cripple. Now, Yanis Xenakis was not crippled, except that he was disfigured and he couldn't see with his left eye, just with the right eye. Um, but Alei Jardinio, the, the remarkable Baroque artist and architect, apparently had a life of... Uh, Parting because his father was a Portuguese architect and uh, 20 something towards 30, he contracted a terrible illness which generally killed. He was not killed, but he was disfigured and crippled. And then he took re revenge, so to speak, through, through art. And he became a great, a major Baroque artist and architect. So why do I mention Alei Giardino? you know, in connection with Yanis Xenakis. I already said it, because even if the circumstances are difficult, even if tragedies happen, and often they do happen in life, we always have a, a, a possibility to, to move beyond them, or very often. And this is the, the chance we have, that we work in a realm that offers such a possibility. And I'm talking about creation, creativity, architecture, art. So let's begin. So Yanis Xenakis, as you see, was born on the 29th of May, 1922, and died on, in, on, on the 4th of February, 2001. Was a Greek-French composer, but, you know, this I took from Wikipedia. I would also say that he was Romanian. He lived here for 10 years music theorist, architect, performance director, and engineer. After 90, in fact, you know, what is written at the end is actually what he was, what he studied. He was actually an engineer. He didn't study architecture. He didn't really study music. He, he studied engineering and he was 
first and foremost, an engineer. After 1947, he fled Greece, becoming a naturalized citizen of France. Xenakis pioneered the use of mathematical models in music, such as applications of set theory, stochastic processes, and game theory, and was also an important influence on the development of electronic and computer music. He integrated music with architecture, designing music for pre-existing spaces and designing spaces to be integrated with specific music compositions and performances. Uh, here he is, here he was. Uh, and um, I like the, you know, the disorder of books in, 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 in the back. And it reminds me this picture a little bit of a picture that, and I regret I don't have it here, of Le Corbusier in his little room when he was younger, where the books were also in kind of in, in, in a disarray. Look at the books there on top of the shelves. You know, kind of like this, where the books in the office, in, not in the office, in the room, private uh, room of uh, Le Corbusier. So let's, let's continue to read. Uh, among, among, uh, among his most important works are metastasis for orchestra. He was, um, uh, he is, uh, in a way, more known as a composer, which introduced uh, in independent parts of every musician of the orchestra. Percussion, percussion works such as Safa and Pleiades, compositions that introduce partializations by dispersing musicians among the audience such as Teret Korch, electronic works created using um, such as Xenakis UPIC system, I don't know what this is, and the massive multi multimedia performances Xenakis called poly polytops that were a summa of his interests and skills. Among the numerous theoretical writings he authored, the book formalized music, thought and mathematics in composition is regarded as one of his most important. As an architect, Senakis is primarily known for his early work on the Le Corbusier, the Saint-Marie de la Tourette, on which the two architects collaborated, and the Philips Pavilion at Expo 58 from Brussels, which Senakis designed by himself. Uh, you know, and as I said, that that uh, building was placed on the on the cover of a book on 100 years of modern architecture. Here he is, you know, a Chevalier. De la, you know, you know, he received a lot of prizes, and uh, you know, even from the the ambitious uh, and demanding French Academy. And you see him accordingly uh, dressed here. We are going to look at his uh, painting. Uh, at his uh, sorry, at his. Um, uh, awards. Born of Greek parents, Yanis Xenakis left Romania for Greece at the age of 10, where he continued his scientific, graduated from the Ecole Polytechnique or the Polytechnical School in 1940-19. He studied from for seven years during the war. And musical studies, notably with the Russian composer Aristotle Kundorov. Resistant from the start, having experienced the I, I read about this and I can't even pronounce it. And now I don't remember what I read, Maki. Prison, internment camps, torture, sentenced to death by the, by the regime for political reasons. And as a terrorist, he was considered a terrorist, this great, great artist. He managed to reach France where he obtained nationality in 1965. As an architect and from his arrival in France, Yanis Xenakis was, for 12 years, one of Le Corbusier's closest collaborators for technique as well as for aesthetics. Not a little thing. It is very obvious that Le Corbusier valued him very highly. At the same time, if in 1948, Nadia Boulanger and Arthur, uh, Hune Arthur uh, Honegger refused him entry to the composition class, Darius Milhot gave him some advice and Xenakis followed Olivier Messiaen's class of analysis and musical aesthetics for two years. 
So he did have some formal training, but um, you know, not not the typical one. You know, from the beginning to the end, the conservatory and the courses of Hermann Scherchen at uh, Gravesano, Gravesano, Gravesano. Anyway, inventor of the concept of musical masses, stochastic music, and symbolic music by introducing the calculation of probabilities and the theory of sets in the composition of instrumental electroacoustic and computer music, Yanis Xenakis is also the inventor of several compositional techniques constituting the lingua franca of the avant-garde. Again, here he is. Here he was. His particularly rich work is performed in all the major cities of the world, devoting festivals and symposiums to him many times rewarded his approach earned him to be invited as a visiting professor in the largest universities in the world. Knight of the Legion d'Honneur, uh, Legion of Honor, Officer of Arts and Letters in France, all of these, Officer of the Legion of, uh, Legion of Honor, uh, Legion d'Honneur, Commander of the National Order of Mary. This man who was considered in Greece a terrorist and was condemned to death, arrived at the highest honors in a you know, culture like the French. This is not a little thing at all. So there are many websites that uh, you know, address certain aspects of his life and, and of his uh, creativity. This is one of them, Académie des Beaux-Arts in France, Yanis Xenakis. And here he was in, a, in, in an article published uh, by the Guardian in the United States, in, 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 the, in Great Britain, sorry. Uh, this is a picture which I like very much because uh, it shows clearly we are dealing here with a, you see behind him, uh, you know, planets and so on. Apparently he was very, very interested. He had a, a very intense interest in uh, astronomy. And, and this relates to some of his architectural work. And when we arrive there, I'm going to mention it. Yanis Xenakis and Le Corbusier. Here they are, two architects together having just two functioning eyes because Le Corbusier lost his um, sight in his uh, right, in his, um, I think in his right eye, while uh, Yanis Xenakis lost his sight in his left eye. And uh, under rather mysterious uh, circumstances, I don't know exactly. I, I remember reading that um, Le Corbusier apparently lost his sight in that eye when he was uh, 28, when he was painting at night. Now, many people paint at night, but I mean, I don't know of any other one who, who lost the sight in the, you know, who lost one eye in the process of painting. So isn't it strange that here we have these two remarkable men, both suffering of a similar condition, but they are here waiting for the train uh, on the, you know, uh, the railway, uh, Belgian railways um, to take the train back to, to Paris. They were working at that time for the, uh, Philips Pavilion, which was uh, indeed uh, a remarkable building, and we can only uh, be said that it was demolished. Someone even said, you know, app apparently even Tour Eiffel, the famous Tour Eiffel, was to be a temporary structure, also built with on the occasion of a World Expo, but is still on and it's a symbol of, uh, of France, of, of France even, of Paris. But this remarkable building was demolished. Not that it was the only one because other remarkable buildings were demolished after a uh, world, uh, world Expo. And it's enough to, re to, to recall the great buildings built in Köln, Cologne in Germany in 1914, where they were, they were demolished a few months after they were built because the first world war started. This is the office of Le Corbusier. This was the, the office of Le Corbusier. And uh, as you recognize on the right, the master, but on the left in the foreground is 
Yanis um, Xenakis, apparently with a cigarette in his hand. And then uh, I don't know who are all the other people working for Le Corbusier, but I do know this man here, the, the most, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, tired in a way of a lot of work. And from what I remember, he also didn't get paid, at least at the beginning. And here I'm talking about the rather recent Pritzker Prize uh, laureate um, uh, B. V. Doshi, the great uh, Indian architect who received the Pritzker Prize for architecture, who never studied architecture. He didn't study architecture ever. Yannick Senakis, Doshi never studied architecture, but he founded a school of architecture. And of course, Le Corbusier being so famous that he never went to school, to a school of architecture. Now, what do you make of this? This is an interesting triangle, isn't it? Senakis, Doshi, Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier, Doshi, Senakis, none went to school, but they created a lot in and for architecture. Bravo to them. Now, what you don't know perhaps is that the, the actual office, the, the private room that the great master Le Corbusier had was somewhere here in the back of the, this, this used to be, if I remember well, some kind of a monastery and this was a corridor. And this is, the, this is where the office of Le Corbusier was. And his private office was somewhere here in the back on the right a very little room, like two met meters point 27, two meters 27, so twice, two meters 27 by two meters 27, and the third dimension, I always forget, two meters and something. So not bigger than a bathroom without a window. And apparently at one point, it had the walls painted in black. That's what I read, I read. Uh, <laughs> Quite a strange office, was it not? Anyway, I guess, uh, you know, uh, certain um, suffering conditions or conditions, uh, uh, you know, inducive to, to, to you know, uh, suffering could uh, entice, could, uh, could uh, intensify creativity in certain people. Anyway, moving forward, here we have Le Corbusier, and uh, behind the younger uh, Yanis Xenakis. Uh, I don't know who the third person is here, hidden uh, be behind the, the hat of uh, Monsieur Le Corbusier. So this was in 1958. Le Corbusier died in 1965. So uh, this was 17 years before he died. So he was around um, 60 years old, Le Corbusier here. Uh, playing with, uh, with a model of uh, uh, the Philips Pavilion. And I discovered on the web this puzzling uh, and even troubling uh, diagram. One circle named Le Corbusier, the other circle named with the um, letters the same size, Yanis Xenakis. And from the intersection of the two circles, we get a domain vesicali called Notre Dame du Haut et Ronchamp. Can you believe it? Someone that was not me, I discovered this on the web, thought that Ronchamp, the celebrated uh, chapel by Le Corbusier, was influenced by the presence of Yanis Xenakis in the office of Le Corbusier. Who knows? I'm not an expert. I will not uh, say more than just that I discovered this, but someone thought of this, that Ronchamp was born from two circles with the same diameter, one representing Le Corbusier, the, one, the other one representing representing Yanis Xenakis. This could be an interesting subject for research. Some drawings by Yanis Xenakis. Uh, he was also considered a visionary and indeed he was in, in his music, in his architecture and in his urban proposals. And we are going to say a few more words about this later. I like very much his um, uh, you know, uh, musical scores. 
because they are minute, they are precise, they are mathematical, but they are also welcoming randomness. You know, and it's, it's, it's this almost impossible meeting between rigor and randomness or chance. Let's give chance a chance. I keep saying this to myself and I also say to you, give chance a chance, allow chance to manifest itself. Don't try to control everything. How else are we to arrive at freedom if we try to impose our human will beyond certain limits? And look at this. This is a musical score and it is beautiful, graphically beautiful. And it's done, was done by Yanis Xenakis. There were other great composers like John Cage who also welcomed chains and who also produced some very beautiful, um, graphically beautiful um, uh, musical scores. Uh, this is a study of course of, in, in, of architecture and uh, you know, he arrived at building based on, on such studies. Apparently he, he was very fond of and very knowledgeable in the field of mathematics, not just because he studied engineering, but he had a, a genuine uh, attraction to mathematics. And you know, and again and again, this man never studied architecture and he studied music, you know, here and there, but not, not quite as rigorously as some other people entering after high school, university and graduating. He struggled, but his struggle, struggles came to fruition. Look at this beautiful drawing. Look at that tree, which is drawn like a child. And uh, the, the one on the right as well. This, this shows a lot of, 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 of uh, innocence. And I, and I think we miss innocence a lot these days. We are afraid to draw like this because we'll be dismissed that they don't look professional. This drawing doesn't look professional. Well, it's a quality that it doesn't look professional. This is a drawing done by one uh, a visionary architect who uh, built some remarkable things and he didn't need to impress us with a professionally drawn tree or who knows what. Bravo to him. What do we see here? We see an attempt through geometry to arrive at flying, at freedom. Did he build this? The dia or diatop or the diatop or the polytop of uh, Bobur. He built it in front of Centre Georges Pompidou or the Bobur Center, Center in, in, in Paris. And we are going to see images of it. Again, what do we see? We see numbers. We see, uh, you know, uh, a drawing which uh, uh, appears to have some, uh, some logic. But then we also see an attempt to break logic, to dismantle logic and to arrive at the unknown as uh, Arthur Rimbaud, the great uh, French poet uh, asked, um, you know, the poet to do, to arrive at the unknown or the immeasurable as Louis Kahn would say. He built this work, the Polito Boburg, and we are going to see it later. This is, a, I don't know how to call it, a sketch by Yanis um, uh, Xenakis. I love this. I don't know what it is. It reminds me a little bit of the drawings of uh, Botticelli. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a tree of sound in a way. It's like, it, it's very lyrical. It's almost musical, you know, although it's a graphic work. And again, it shows innocence. Music and Architecture by Yanis Xenakis, translated, compiled, and presented by the Yanis Xenakis series number one. Music and Architecture. Not bad. After all, both arts uh, being similar, be being the only abstract arts because they are both based on, on, on um, numerical notations. The other arts are plastic, you know, they, they find inspiration in nature. And uh, in this case, music and architecture are considered the, the only two abstract arts. 
and they are considered uh, sisters. You know very well that uh, architecture is considered, was considered by Goethe and others, fro frozen music. This is what he said, Yanis Xenakis. Music is not a language. Any musical piece is akin to a boulder with complex forms, with stri striations and engraved designs atop and within, which man can decipher in a thousand different ways without ever finding the right answer or the best one. You can find interviews with uh, Yanis Xenakis on YouTube, very interesting ones. Architecture. Now let's look at some buildings he built. And I managed to, uh, I, I was actually lucky talking about chains. I discovered the website, which was created last year when it was the centennial of Yanis Xenakis. And the generous, uh, inspired, and informed uh, uh, lady, she created a, a catalog, um, a compilation of the, of, of the architectural works of Yanis Xenakis. And without claiming any originality, I um, show to you what I learned from that web website. A catalog created by Elsa Kurtz, a Greek lady, but uh, I have difficulties to read her family name and I apologize. It was published on this uh, website, Yanis Xenakis org, um, you know, category works, architecture in English. And the commentaries that I'm going to read belong to her. So they are not mine, they are hers, but I thought that it would be good to bring some order in my um, uh, presentation and to, to listen to a, an informed text in, uh, which, which will make us better understand the architectural works that we are presenting or I am presenting. We start with L'Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, a very famous work by Le Corbusier, uh, where, where Yanis Xenakis had some uh, input, and it will be explained in what way. This, particularly at the top on the roof, and it happened that I, I spent a sunny afternoon uh, on that roof, on this building in Marseille, uh, a lot of concrete, of course, uh, apparently, he did some more for the kindergarten, kindergarten but, but I'm not anticipating. Let's read what, uh, what uh, uh, the website said. A main piece of work of the Le Corbusier workshop, which served as a laboratory for, God, again, I have troubles. I cannot read the, the second line, just a second. Uh, for putting into practice the idea of living together, it was financed by the Ministry of Reconstruction in France in the post-war period. It is an 18-story housing building with 337 apartments of 23 types, including a shopping street, a hotel, a restaurant, and a kindergarten on the roof terrace. As a member of ATBAT, I don't know what this is, Atelier, I, I don't know. Xenakis had to deal with the static calculations because he was an engineer, as uh, I mentioned already, mainly concerning beams and columns. Xenakis began to take architectural initiatives. For example, when he designed in collaboration with Nadir Al Afonso, another painter architect <coughs> who was part of the team, the household garbage collection station. This independent structure is distinguished by its organic forms. Unfortunately, I couldn't find it. I, I couldn't identify it on any picture uh, with, with this, uh, with this uh, important building. These will reappear in Xenaki's design, designs for the street lamps, which will light street being the corridor inside the building. It was called La Rue. Uh, the street which gave, gave access to the apartments within the building. This will reappear in Xenakis' designs for the street lamps, which will light the entrances to the apartments along the shopping street, as well as in the park of the grounds. Xenakis also participated in the design of the kindergarten, a project commissioned from Le Corbusier after the inaugura inauguration uh, of uh, l'unité d'habitation. 
So let's look at some images uh, with children playing on the roof uh, and uh, the Mediterranean Sea, of course, uh, not far away at all because we are talking about Marseille. Uh, I don't know very well what to think of this, you know. I mean, if my kid was, uh, was uh, I mean, I know there are some uh, parapets that are tall enough, but I would still be, but this is my subjectivity, a little bit worried. Um, anyway, they seem to enjoy themselves a lot, and I love this picture very much, you know, the brutalism of uh, the concrete work of uh, Le Corbusier, in Marseille and the, the beautiful children, um, you know, having nothing to do with the, you know, architectonic uh, uh, theories or, uh, you know, uh, accomplishments. But we also see here something that should make us think about the banishing ornament from a modern architecture, because here is a work by Le Corbusier and his office, and what do we see here? clearly ornament. Uh, this is a ventilation tower with a rather a little bit dangerous uh, stair, no parapets on both sides, but uh, Le Corbusier uh, flirted with danger in other cases as well. Uh, other pictures on the roof of l'unité d'habitation. I remember when I visited it, I didn't have troubles on the roof, but I had troubles you know, uh, around the pilotis, uh, the butt on the ground floor, there was a black dog there that, uh, and I was uh, the only human there, if I can call myself a human, I was afraid of that black dog. Um, I, I remember I, 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 I tried in my ways to, to uh, avoid it. Anyway, uh, so I guess the kindergarten is there. You know, uh, or no, maybe is, there is another, is this one here. Probably this is the kindergarten where Yanis Xenakis um, worked or did some work. He, I guess he just began to work for Le Corbusier as, a, as an engineer. He, he did calculations, but uh, he also, we understood, uh, began to indulge himself, took architectural initiatives. Why? Because he had artistic impulses, that's why. And, you know, Le Corbusier was probably indulgent. Nice. I mean, L'Unité d'Habitation made me think that uh, Le Corbusier was actually a little bit afraid of the earth. And he placed, in a way, ground zero on top of some of his buildings. And this is what is happening here. You know, it's, it, it is as if this is ground zero. But it's not, it's actually on the top of the building. Anyway, the children again, but, but, but if I was the parent of some of these children, I would be a little bit worried, to be honest with you. <laughs> anyway. Uh, otherwise, the, the brutalismus of, um, of, uh, of this concrete work is impressive. And I like the fact that he's not in any way trying to, uh, uh, you know, assume any kind of embellishment. The concrete work is shown in its rawness as it's supposed to. Uh, the idea to finish it or to apply finishes to it is, uh, you know, the ornamentalization, the aesthetization of, um, of uh, concrete or, or some other materials uh, would mean, as uh, somebody said, you know, when you have a problem and you aestheticize it too much, uh, it's, it's a proof you didn't resolve it. Anyway, so again, this could have been at the, at the, at the ground floor, at the level of the earth, but it's actually on top of the building. Um, and this is the La Rue, uh, the street, and apparently Yanis Xenakis designed these lamps, uh, as we read. I like the fact that there are, you know, you know, opposite colors here. Now I don't know if this is what um, Le Corbusier decided then, but um, 
this, this corridor is, is actually a little bit uh, bothering in my opinion, because it doesn't have natural light. It's, um, it's cold and it's artificial, you know. But when I visited it, I learned that, uh, I don't know exactly where here. In fact, I learned in Berlin because Le Corbusier um, uh, built four unités d'habitation. Uh, the last one that was built was in Berlin and that one I visited inside and the lady was kind enough to allow us, me and some students to visit one apartment and she told us that they had milk delivered uh, at, the, at the unit. Uh, but here I don't see the, the possibility of, of having, you know, like uh, a postman's uh, uh, things uh, near the entrance door into the apartment. Anyway, and I, this is the second unit of habitation. So he built four, one in Marseille, one in Roselle Nantes, in Nantes, one in Firmini Ver, and one in Berlin. Now, the, here also, um, he worked, uh, Yanis Xenakis, and he did this uh, also a kindergarten. And, you know, I mentioned the innocence of the drawings of, uh, of uh, Yanis Xenakis, and maybe Le Corbusier also noticed something because maybe it's not an accident that he asked uh, Yanis Xenakis to do some works for the kindergarten, both in, the, in Marseille and in, uh, in, uh, in Nantes. And apparently he did this um, aleatory, so you know, Kazuyo Sejima is not the first architect to do this sort of thing. The Yanis Xenakis did it, uh, you know, with more than half a century earlier. But let's, let's read a little bit um, what the Greek author of this um, catalog said. Financed by the cooperative La Maison Familiale, the project aims to provide the city with a new building composed of collect collective housing. We are talking about l'unité d'habitation. This project pushes the standardization and the level of prefabrication of the components to their maximum. The structure includes 294 apartments of seven different types with no collective facilities except for the kindergarten on the roof terrace a post office and the library. Xenakis collaborated closely with Bernard Lafay, an engineer from outside the agency, to set up a new structure following the principle of the shoebox. It is a question of accumulating a, a, autonomous and self supporting cells connected only by lead strips. Contrary to the structure used at the Marseille Unité, this system allows a considerable saving of time and money. Xenakis was involved in several phases of the design and construction of the site. Although he simultaneously directed the organization of the site and validated the formwork plans for certain parts of the facades, many technical and installation details were in his hands. It was probably when he was in charge of the design of the kindergarten located on the roof terrace that the line between architecture and engineering was crossed. Under the watchful eye of Le Corbusier, Xenakis put forward several proposals. Finally, it is music that unconsciously sets the tone. The facades have windows of four standard sizes distributed in a random configuration which undoubtedly uh, recalls the stochastic uh, distribution uh, of uh, his later music, freely inspired by the shape of Gregorian nerves. I don't know if I'll, I pronounce well, I searched on the web what nerves means and I didn't quite understand. Apparently it was a form of uh, musical notations before the, the present one which happened centuries ago. I, I'm, 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 I, I don't have any knowledge, unfortunately, about such matters. And here, here are pictures of this kindergarten. And uh, I mean, can you imagine the placement of these windows being kind of inspired by Gregorian chants? Not bad. It is freedom, essentially. It is music. It is uh, 
the engineer is show, was showing us the way towards um, uh, you know something to to actually break the box the shoe box to animate it with uh, with playfulness and and quite uh, appropriately considering this was a kindergarten unfortunately so many kindergartens are, are are built in the world that are not at all graceful or playful and we torture the the, the children from an early age to to conform to our strict uh, you know a rigid uh, way of thinking I don't know a conference there you know probably architects or who knows who uh, in in the vicinity of the kindergarten Chandigarh. Now we arrive at a major work, of course, and uh, apparently he was involved here in, uh, in you know, uh, uh, with, uh, with in this tower, which he wanted to to promote as some kind of a, uh, for for a, the study of uh, of, uh, of the sun, but it was not. I'm going to read about. Let's let's not uh, anticipate. Uh, again, uh, he he had vast interests not only that he worked within the field of architecture, not only that he did engineering, not only that he was also a composer of the highest stature in, you know, in music, but he also was very interested in astronomy. And what happens here on the top of the parliament building in Shadigar is an exp expression of that. So let's read. The vast project in the Punjabi, uh, I probably pronounced terribly and I ask for forgiveness capital in India was entrusted to Le Corbusier in the early 1950s when the latter's fame was at its peak. In this work done with his cousin Pierre Genre, who directed the site in Chandigarh, Le Corbusier put his signature on the design and construction of the capital palaces that included include the assembly, the secretariat, the palace of justice, the governor's palace, which was not built, as well the surrounding, spark, surrounding parks. Since 1951, Xenakis has been involved in the project in various ways, beginning with the climatic grid inspired by the Siam grid for urbanism. This theoretical study, which was shelved due to criticism from the authorities and Indian architects, would have made it possible to adapt architectural research thanks to a controlled monitoring of, of annual variations in climatic data, air temperature and humidity, thermal radiation of material, speed of air currents. It would have also allowed the passive air conditioning of low cost housing in Chandigarh. Uh, uh, Xenaki's love of astronomy which I mentioned, uh, led him to study in detail the harsh climate of this country and its phenomena. His penchant for theoretical work gave birth to the theoretical study of sunshine, a graphic research of visualization of climatic data for a whole year. <clears throat> Later in 1955, so 10 years before Le Corbusier died, Xenaki's facility with the geometry of forms would help Le Corbusier define the hyper hyperboloid of the lower chamber of the assembly. This form, freely inspired by the cooling towers of nuclear power plants and happily put on a sheet of paper by the master, will find its precise geometric description thanks to Xenaki's calculations and the construction of an impressive wooden model. Uh, I, I would mention here something which is not mentioned, which was not mentioned in this text, that the results of the so-called House of Shadows, a very intriguing structure that Le Corbusier built in the vicinity of the assembly building. And I always ask myself, why, why did they build this structure there? You know, and I and now connecting with Xenakis, I have the feeling that the astronomical uh, interest of Yanis Xenakis probably made it uh, to, you know, to, um, to the uh, domain of interest of Le Corbusier. Anyway, it's hard to know exactly in the dynamics of an office what happens. But 
more and more I feel that actually it was not by accident that uh, Yanis Xenakis in that picture with the, all the workers in the office of Le Corbusier was right there distinctly on the left, almost uh, you know, symmetrically situated vis-a-vis -vis the master. So back to the text written uh, in Greece with his friend and Greek engineer Pavlo Pulo, Pavlopoulos, he, he worked on the static, interesting that this lady, she, she always uh, or often uses the present tense. He said, she said, he works. Well, he worked, but maybe the present tense is okay too. So he works, he worked on the static profile of the tower and its interior design. Uh, we are talking about the tower on top on the roof of the, the assembly building. Senakis proposed that the upper part of the tower function as a sun laboratory. Nice. A kind of astronomical observatory, an idea that was not realized due to technical and budgetary restrictions. He also collaborated with Philips engineers who were responsible for the Philips Pavilion project at the 1958 World's Fair entrusted to the Le Corbusier studio. In order to solve acoustic problems as well as ventilation, and lighting problems within the tower. Finally, to solve the problem of the fenestration of the Secretariat's facades, Xenakis and Le Corbusier did with it correctly. The author placed uh, Xenakis' name in front of the name of Le Corbusier, used a technique used by Indian masons, spotted by Pierre Gendre, Le Corbusier's cousin, during the construction, on a non-load bearing facade, they decided to build up frameless glass directly on the concrete and to alternate it with pivoting wooden panels to ensure ventilation. Being at the same time responsible for the project of Saint Marie de la Tourette convent and uh, another major work by Le Corbusier where uh, Yanis Xenakis was actually you know, the, 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 sorry, I don't know what happened here. God, uh, just a second. Ah. So being at the same time responsible for the project La Tourette, which presents the same problem of fenestration of the long non-loaded bearing facade, not load bearing facades, Xenakis would elaborate, uh, again, I have problems. I'm really sorry about this. It is covering this maddening line. Uh, I cannot read the, the text. It's, it's unbelievably frustrating. Okay. Um, Xenakis would elaborate a device of distribution of glass panels by calling upon his musical research on the read from a range called wave of standard distances taken from the two series of the modulor linked to the golden ratio, Xenakis generated trans, generates transformed ranges that he superimposes, inverts and permutes, setting up a kind of spatial counterpoint on the different floors. A very you know, technical assessment here. This non-regular distribution avoids the monotony of an accumulation of identical windows. Again and again, it was a quest for freedom freedom for movement. It will be the subject of a patent registered by Le Corbusier and will henceforth bear the name Pan de Verre, ondulatoire. It will become a signature for the workshop for several works, even after the departure of Xenakis in 1959. So obviously Xenakis didn't spend his time in, in, uh, in, in the office of Le, Cor Le Corbusier for nothing. Uh, okay, let's. Um, this is a drawing. I don't know if it belonged to Le Corbusier, but the handwriting seems to be not seems not to belong to Le Corbusier because I had seen many many drawings with the handwriting by Le Corbusier. Maybe it was it belonged to Xenakis. And this is sorry for the picture. There is the tower where he wanted to make a sun laboratory, and they couldn't do it. Now, um, I, I should have had more images with uh, this important work at, at, uh, at um, Chandigarh, but uh, I don't. 
Couvent Saint Marie de la Tourette. Uh, unfortunately, I know there is a technical translation of the word Couvent, which is not quite a monastery. It, 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 there is a slight difference between what Couvent means and what the monastery is. But I, I, I cannot, I, I didn't comprehend it. And uh, as Louis Kahn said, we only learn what we already know. So I guess I never knew the difference between Couvent and monastery. Uh, so the, it's kind of a monastery, but there is a you know a theological uh, difference between one and the other. Saint Marie de la Tourette, and uh, he had uh, here uh, important an important output. In fact, he was the the, the main man in this project, Yanis Xenakis. It is known that this is a project where he was. Uh, uh, the project uh, manager and more than a manager also he designed things and he, he was the main man uh, in this particular project. Uh, let's read the Dominican convent in uh, Labrel near Lyon entrusted to Le Corbusier in 1953 is part of a global attempt to renew the vocabulary of sacred architecture. For the first time since he joined the studio, Xenakis assumed full responsibility for the architecture and became head of the project. Although the general form comes from the hand of Le Corbusier and is now one of the finest examples of brutalist architecture, Xenakis would put his signature in several of its elements. He developed the internal structure and circulation and implemented and evolved the, the undulating glass panels, which you already mentioned, on the coven, convent's uh, facades, first designed for the secretariat in Chandigarh. He also designed the monk's cells, and I slept a night, night there, and if you visit La Tourette near um, Lyon, you can rent uh, a cell, a monk's cell, and sleep there. The shape of the special openings called canons of light fixed in such a way as to illuminate the crypt according to the change in sunlight and the machine guns. Now, what do machine guns have to do with the monastery or with the co convent? Which bring light into the church sacristy. Plastic elements such as the piano form that houses the chapels, adiacent to the church, the pyramid of the sacristy, the interior spiral staircase and the comb-like columns that are part of a piling in the western part are also by his hand, meaning Xenakis. Because of Le Corbusier's long absences in India, Xenakis was the main contact with the monks and negotiated directly with the contractors on the installation of electricity, heating, sanitary facilities, and conduits. Finally, he did not hesitate to propose acoustic devices for the church called Acoustic uh, Diamonds and designed a device on its roof to broadcast liturgies uh, to the surrounding valley. The project exceeded the budget considerably and these ideas were abandoned. These are the machine guns, you know, which bring light into the religious space underneath. Um, yeah, Xenakis work. These are the, you know, also done by him. They, they, they bring light uh, underneath and they also have this, um, you know, they, they are called canons. Also, you know, a, a military language. You see here the view from the inside, the way they, uh, they really shoot light into the, into the space underneath. La Tourette by the office of Le Corbusier, where we know now, Xenakis was the, was the head of the project. Uh, again, seeing, seeing uh, the canons from the outside. And uh, again, from the inside with a Dominican uh, monk uh, there uh, praying. A Dominican, Dominican, Dominican monk who was not troubled at all by the, you know, the, the chromatic modernity of the surroundings and the brutalist uh, texture of the concrete and so on. Enlightened monks, what else can we say? In fact, uh, Le Corbusier was known for uh, initially 
not wanting to be a Libre Rochamp, but there was a, a, an important uh, Dominican monk, uh, a lover, uh, lover, no, sorry for the word, uh, a great friend of um, the modern artist, uh, Couturier, who convinced him to take the commission for Enchamp and probably for La Tourette as well. And we can only be grateful to Couturier. Here we see this uh, musical, so to speak, division of the, of the glass um, uh, that is actually the, the musical architectonic uh, uh, input of Yanis Xenakis with these uh, comb-like, uh, you know, vertical elements. Um, and uh, here we see uh, again, you know, this uh, rhythm rhythmicity which refuses um, abhorrent repetition. Uh, here we see also the, 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 the same uh, motif, so to speak, underneath the, you know, the part with the, with the, with the, with the cell for the monks, with the corridor. These are actually the balconies of, of the cells where the monks live, live. And here is the picture with the, you know, with the master of the game, Le Corbusier. You recognize him because of the, of the hat, which he never took off even inside and with some Dominican monks around him. I have to tell you that on this hill, the, there are buried the, the, the monks, the Dominican monks who died. So they are, they are buried in close proximity to the building. I wonder what they felt, you know, because this is certainly a radical language, especially for, a, you know, a sacred uh, space. The fact that they accepted shows to me that you know not all religious building uh, people are, are dogmatic trapped in their dogmas as they are in our country you know i'm referring to the greek orthodox religion and what is even funny is that here the was the head of the project was a greek uh, a greek uh, architect and it might be that this was him here i don't know i don't know but who else well, anyway it could have been someone else Anyway, a moving picture that makes me also a little bit nostalgic because I spent a few minutes um, sitting on the grass on this very hill. The Olympic Stadium in Baghdad, yes, Le Corbusier built also in Baghdad, but this was built after he died and the kind of shows, you know, the, the, the concrete uh, is too, for my taste as well, I prefer it raw. But here is too smooth and too so-called civilized. And uh, no, it's not, a, in my opinion, it's not such a great work. But let's read. The design of the major sports complex on the banks of the Tigris, Tig Tigris, Tigris River was part of the development and modernization plan for the city of Baghdad. The Corbusier entrusted the project to Xenakis who enjoyed enjoying total freedom in terms of the program had a broad vision, a stadium for 50,000 people, a gymnasium with a capacity of 3,500 spectators, a numerous swimming pools and open air, uh, open air playing fields. More precisely, in 1958, Xenakis concentrated on the shape of the large stadium than on the roof of the uh, gymnasium. For the later, later, he continued his experiments with the reinforced concrete paraboloid, which he had discovered during the Philips Pavilion project some time earlier. Le Corbusier rejected his proposal, judging the scale of the building disproportionate. But Xenakis, having more confidence in himself, persisted and even designed the sunshades of the large stadium, still using paraboloidal elements. In 1959, a change of site imposed a total revision of the project and coincided with the dismissal of Xenakis from the studio in 1959. But in 1964, the sports complex is still not, was not, still not realized. The Iraqi government postponed the project, but the death of Le Corbusier in 1965 and the Iraqi revolution in 1968 would further postpone its realization. Only in 1970, 
uh, you read it because now this maddening thing is blocking me the possibility of reading. Finally, in 1973, and I know you don't even know what I'm talking about, and I would perfectly understand you. In 1973, Georges Présenté finally took on the task of designing and building a new architecture for the gymnasium. He kept the facades in undulating glass panels. But you can tell there, there are, you know, uh, foreign uh, hands. This is not the work. This is not any longer the work of uh, Le Corbusier and Xenakis. Now, it's a different work. And that's why I wouldn't even insist. On it. But now we are up at the masterpiece, the ultimate masterpiece of Yanis Xenakis and Le Corbusier, the Philips Pavilion in Brussels, in Brussels, in Belgium. Truly uh, a formidable work. And if this building was still alive, it would, would be considered by many as one of the most emblematic buildings of the 20th century, 21st century. Unfortunately, it was demolished. Uh, there is a book, look at it, a very thick book dedicated just to this building, or I, that I don't know, but it, it is on the cover of the book with the intriguing title, Le Corbusier and the Brahila born Yanis Xenakis. Now look at that, with a huge ant. Can you imagine making it, uh, you know, in the proximity of um, uh, Le Corbusier Le Grand as uh, the title of one of the biggest books published in modern times, 10 kilograms it has about Le Corbusier. It's called Le Corbusier Le Grand. And uh, near Le Corbusier Le Grand stands right there, the man born and raised in Braila, Yanis Xenakis. Not bad, bravo to him. So let's read, the Dutch company Philips wanted to participate in the 1958 World's Fair in Brussels, in Brussels, the first after World War II with, with its own temporary pavilion. It invited Le Corbusier knowing his international reputation. Upon approaching Le Corbusier, the firm's artistic director, Louis Kahl, realized that the architect was more interested in the audio, audio visual show inside the pavilion, a distant dream of the painter architect, meaning Le Corbusier, that had uh, never been fulfilled then in its architectural coverage. After rejecting Gary Riedveld's proposal uh, for the, the, the architecture of the pavilion, the architect of the neighboring Dutch pavilion, uh, Ridwell designed the neighboring Dutch pavilion. Le Corbusier drew a stomach shaped sketch and entrusted its elaboration to Xenakis. Anxious to leave the interior space completely unobstructed and to offer optimal acoustics, the architect composer, meaning Xenakis, turned to left handed surfaces and covered the plane of the so called stomach with thin reinforced concrete shells in the form of hyperbolic paraboloids and conoids. The descriptive geometry plans that emerged from this Xenakis research would be used by the firm. <laughs> I cannot read, I cannot read because a maddening thing from Zoom is blocking me. The, the, you read it, please read it for me. I cannot read it. It is, it is nothing in my life was and is so frustrating of this thing. It, 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 you probably don't understand what I'm talking about, but I don't see that, that line. I finally can because I moved the meddling menu list from uh, covering it. So the descriptive geometry plans that emerge from this Xenakis research will be used, would be used when the firm seeks to consult, seek to consult with engineers specializing in self-supporting structures. Uh, we continue to read the Belgian company Strabad, chosen for the construction of the pavilion, succeeded in respecting Xenakis plans and built one of the leading icons of 20th, uh, 20th century avant-garde architecture. In addition, two mathematical objects, one suspended inside and the second placed at the entrance were designed by Xenakis. 
Finally, Le Corbusier, enjoying total freedom, imposed the participation of Edgar Varese uh, uh, for the composition of the music of the show and solicited Xenakis to compose two minutes of an interlude, interlude sonore, 1958, which, which would later be re recorded under the title of Concrete, Concrete PH. The Philips Pavilion was a huge success during the exposition. However, the dispute between Le Corbusier and Xenakis about the authorship of the pavilion's phone became crucial and deteriorated their collaboration. A year later, Xenakis left the studio at the <laughs> initiative of his boss. You know what that means. He was uh, dismissed but I'm sure they respected each other very highly. Uh, and they, they did create a remarkable building here. And it, it, um, it, it is even more remarkable that this man born in Braila actually arrived at designing this thing that was the talk of the exhibition. And it would be the talk of the world if it was still uh, um, you know, uh, alive. The madness of human beings, they, 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 they realize sometimes beautiful things and then they destroy them. What a shame. This is a, you know, a presentation board with a, with a building done recently. Uh, look at the plan, you know. Is it a stomach? Maybe, you know, but it's certainly, you know, uh, immeasurable and, uh, and beautiful in its freedom. Um, it's mathematically done, it is correct structurally, but it's also immeasurable. So Louis Kahn was correct. A great building begins with the immeasurable. And then it goes through the measurable, meaning the design phase. And at the end, it comes back to being immeasurable. But all of this done through measurements, paradoxically. Now, I don't know if this sketch, this was done by, by Le Corbusier or was done by Xenakis based on the instructions from Le Corbusier. But the fact that this became a building is miraculous. And these are scenes, I mean, from the video that was projected on the walls of the, of the, of the pavilion. Uh, of course, uh, during the film, because I saw it, and you can see it also on YouTube, just type in uh, Philips Pavilion, Brussels, and uh, you will see the video that was prepared by Le Corbusier and Le Corbusier team. And he was advertising himself too with some, you know, buildings by him. Of course, architects can never abstain from doing something like this. Xenakis, Philips Pavilion. You see, the name of Le Corbusier doesn't even appear. appear appears the name of Xenakis. Uh, another image from the from the the inside during the the show. Just look at the pavilion of Austria on the left, a country with remarkable architecture, and look at the uh, the building, the Philips Pavilion by uh, Xenakis and Le Corbusier. And you cannot compare them. I mean, one is exuberant, as creative, is even falling a little bit. You know, it's, it's very complex, uh, very complex and uh, unexpected. Uh, bravo to them, truly. It deserves to be on the cover of a, of a big book with 100 years of modern architecture, as it, as it uh, recently was chosen. Look at the cars and look at the building. They belong to two different times, two different eras. Not that I don't like old cars. I do very much, but they are dated. The building is not. This building would be future looking even in the 22nd century and 23rd and 50th century and you name it. Yanis Xenakis and music. Uh, a few pictures of, of this uh, remarkable man. Uh, <laughs> Again, as a young man, you know, enamored of music. And here explaining to some children in Japan, perhaps the virtues of, uh, of, of, of the computer, well ahead of his time. Again, he was a, a far-seeing man. 
Arts and Youth Center in Firmini. This is also built by him. Well, when he was work for Le Corbusier, and I, and I saw it. We see his signature work with the windows. You know, with this uh, uh, asystematic, apparently asystematic placement of the vertical elements. Um, so this cultural complex in Firmini Ver. Firmini Ver uh, benefited from a great uh, mayor, Claudius Petit, who was a uh, visionary himself. And Firmini Ver, a little place, a little town in, 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 in France, has four buildings by uh, Le Corbusier, thanks to Claudius Petit, an enlightened political man. So this cultural complex, part of a vast operation of reconstruction and urban development in Firmini, was intended to link the old town and the new districts of Firmini Ver. Le Corbusier proposed to merge the sports facilities and the Maison de la Culture by organizing the spaces in a mirror fashion. Xenakis being the project manager in collaboration with Tobito, I don't know who Tobito is, designed the first version taking into account the following idea. The building should be organized along the sports field, theater rooms, classes, and workshops, while the negative of the stadium's bleaches, bleachers inside the building, the benches of the meeting spaces, the shelves for the library, and the stands for the theater rooms are placed. The second project, also designed by Xenakis and Tobito, is distinguished by the sloping roof finally realized. Le Corbusier wanted to see this roof suspended and vegetated. This idea would not be realized for technical reasons. Finally, on two facades of the building, there is an arrangement of undulating glass panels invented by Xenakis on plans made after his departure. And this is, uh, this is the building. Also not afraid to assume primary colors when needed. Auditorium for Hermann Scherchen, uh, musical man. Let's read a little bit about him. This is a sketch. So again, I only show the works in which Yanis Xenakis was involved when he worked for Le Corbusier, but also outside of uh, you know, the office of Le Corbusier. So uh, you know, in, in this case, uh, <laughs> Again, it's shortening my life. I cannot read the first. It's unbelievably frustrating and I don't know what to do. It's blocking the view of the first line. I move the damn thing downwards so I can read it. Xenakis had a decisive encounter with the conductor Hermann Scherchen, Scherchen, I don't know, I don't know. Following the premiere of Varese, Varese's or Varese, Varese's desert, desert in Paris, in 1954, since then, this person, uh, this conductor, has taken the young composer under his wing and regularly invited him to the summer academies he organized in his experimental music center in Gravesano, Switzerland. When in 1961 he decided to create an important place for musical encounters and aud audiovisual research, he asked Senakis to design a room for experimental music. The plan that the architect sent to him, entitled SCHR 100 in the early fall of 1961, shows the continuity of his research on hyperbolic paraboloids begun with the Philips Pavilion. The thin reinforced concrete shells that cover the space are now less steep than those of the Dutch, Dutch Pavilion, allowing the public to walk on the roof, thus implanting the building in its environment. In addition, Xenakis pushed the plastic and constructive challenge even further by proposing four parabo paraboloid structures instead of three used for Philips, a paper model, a few sketches, and the plan geometrically defining the curves are the only witnesses to Xenakis' architectural research on concert spaces, which was not realized due to a, a lack of means, meaning money, always a trouble in the world money. And here is what we have from Xenakis on this subject. 
but even this page as it is moving as it is because it does move me to see this beautiful encounter between geometry lofty aspirations and uh, the ability to the ability to express them visually and the model rough as it is but probably it would have been a very nice building and we read that uh, you know it would have been possible to actually climb on the roof it was not built the cosmic city now we arrive at a very important moment in this presentation in my opinion because here xenakis pushed the limit of limits of urbanism but let's um, this is the sketch he made he was invited to make a proposal which he called the cosmic city and this is a drawing that he made but let's read a little bit about it francois choi and a well-known uh, name in the in the field of uh, architectural theory and history during the preparation of a book l'urbanisme utopie et réalité urbanism utopias and research realities asked asked senakis who at the time was living in berlin as a ford foundation grant holder to make a proposal for the city of the future bravo to Francoise. you see a forward-looking uh, lady uh, uh, commissioning uh, a forward-looking uh, architect musician to make a proposal for the city of the future the composer architect was impregnated with the urbanist uh, urbanistic discourses of the 60s which magnified technology and questioned the sprawl of cities the later cons constituting one of the theoretical pillars of the modern movement of the beginning of the of the century he made his proposal a true utopia xenakis proposed several towers in the form of hyperboloids of revolution stretching up to five kilometers in height my god my god three times more than three times taller than the one mile tower proposed by uh, frank lloyd wright not without recalling that of the assembly of shandigar this set of towers sheltered was supposed to shelter a city of five million people five million inhabitants thanks to a system system of ventilation of circulation to live on the earth vertically to touch the clouds and to open up to galactic space these dreams of xenakis will reappear later in the polytops and we are going to see on the formal level the cosmic city can be considered a manifesto a volumetric architecture a concept developed by xenakis as an as an alternative to the modernist paradigm of the straight line and the right angle considered obsolete and even abstractive by him the idea to realize architecture where no two sections are the same is taken here to a monumental scale sven sterken i don't know who he is but he said it very well and this is a, a website from where i took the short text but it, it's a much more ample and i truly suggest to anyone interested in xenakis to try to access this website and read about his cosmic utopia proposal a very interesting subject and a very interesting proposal now a house of francois bernard mash in mash i guess in greece uh, down to the earth back to the earth so to speak uh, that he built by himself without being uh, associated any longer with uh, le corbusier uh, having been condemned to death in 1947 for having deserted the national army but i don't think this was the reason i think it's because he fought in the resistance xenakis was forbidden to stay in greece he proposed a plan conceived for the from the photos of monsieur mash provided him in 1967 he drew five independent units that communicate communicate with each other from the outside freely inspired by the traditional houses of the greek islands there followed a seven-year pause probably due to the dictatorship of the colonels who took power in greece during the period 1967-1974 then 
the construction site started. The project of realization of the plans and construction was entrusted to Greek architects during the summer of 1974. By that time, Le Corbusier was dead for nine years. Located at the seaside on the Bay of Pirocomos, on the island of Amorgos, the building site is accessible only by boat or on foot. The budget was quick, quickly exe exceeded and one of the five buildings could not be built. The facades have a set of windows and openings arranged in right angles, similar to the pneumatic movements that Xenakis first introduced at La Tourette and Rosé Lenant from the Gregorian notation. On the roof of the central living space, one can see a particular construction that diffuses light into the living space. It is a path of light of a width of 40 centimeters, which materializes the roof on the roof of the central unit of stay and recalls the interest for the openings towards the sky, such as the machine guns and the cannons of light, which we saw at the church of La Tourette. So this is the building in Greece that uh, Xenakis built, or should we say, well, there were supposed to be five buildings uh, inspired by traditional houses in Greece, but he built only four. And, uh, and a rather unclear picture from above, but you can still get an idea. And some pictures from the inside, very interesting uh, the windows, if we have to call them windows, no? Why not? Maybe Wright was correct when he said uh, architecture is, is not really, would, would not be really difficult if there wasn't the problem of windows. Windows, uh, yeah, complicate matters. But here, Xenakis is quite uh, creative, as you can see. Uh, it's quite a distance from the towers he proposed in, in his cosmic uh, city for, uh, you know, five kilometers in height. And, uh, you know, these houses belonging so much to the earth. Also, he was invited to propose, make a proposal for a Centre des Arts, Le Corbusier. The International Association Les Amis de Le Corbusier contact, contacted Xenakis through a former collaborator of the Rue de Sèvres studio, that is José Luis Sir, uh, who also worked for a short while with Le Corbusier, to propose the establishment of a program for a center for research, an artistic practice dedicated to the visual arts. Located near Le Corbusier's birthplace in Switzerland, La Chaux de Fond, a terrible city, which probably explains the terrible urbanism of Le Corbusier. The center would serve as a decentralized hub to attract international artists and scientists. Xenakis accepted and worked on the project along with the design of a similar center in Shiraz, but his collaboration remained at the conceptual stage and was abandoned in 1972. Now, Cité des Shiraz, here is written a little bit differently, Shiraz, the last empress of Iran, Farak Diva Pahlavi, commissioned Xenakis to build a large cultural center, comple cultural complex over 20,000 square meters in 1971. Several types of rooms for the visual and sound arts were planned, as well as centers for pedagogy and technological research on sound and image, playgrounds and open air concerts, and a residence park for visiting artists and researchers. Certainly part of the Iranian monarchy's desire to get closer to the West, but this project has remained at an embryonic stage of conception. Sad. Now another house built for this René Schneiders in Corsica, similar to the house we saw in Greece, but uh, much more modest. I mean, just one, uh, one, one house built for his friend René Schneider, one of the co-founder of Centre d'Etudes de Mathématique et Automatique Musical. Xenakis restored the sheepfold in Corsica, comprising two ruined buildings to which he added a small extension. 
we can feel, uh, we can feel uh, Xenakis touch, such as the pneumatic openings of the house of Mash in Amorgos, which you see, and the canon of light on the roof. The roofs of the existing sheepfolds are raised 12 centimeters above the load bearing walls, allowing light to enter through windows inserted in the gap. The large curved reinforced concrete roof, a distant memory of the forms designed by Le Corbusier for the chapel of Ronchamp and for the terrace roof of the Maison de la Culture in Firmini, or for the entrance for the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, shelters the entrance and provides the shade so appreciated in Mediterranean countries. And here is the, uh, you know, uh, picture of, of this um, you know, rather modest building. Now, a bro project for a house in Borrego Springs for Karen and Roger Reynolds in the United States was not never built. And yes, it kind of looks North American and I'm kind of happy it was not built. Through meetings at international festivals, the couple made by the composer, Roger and artist Karen Reynolds approached Xenakis, uh, appreciating Mash, Mash, Mash home in Greece, designed by the Greek architect. They asked him in 1984 to design their new vacation home on a, on a newly acquired lot in Borrego Springs, California. The first sketch forecasts uh, uh, six units arranged on a periphery of a closed uh, circle that the architect gradually opened up into a horseshoe shape. As soon as the layout of the units was decided, the Xenakian signatures appeared. The pneumatic windows, undulating glass facades, and the light cannon on the roof of the duplex living room. The cells took the form of a patatoid variation similar to those in the concert hall of the Cité de la Musique, which he also proposed, Xenak, is a very interesting project. A local architect was hired to build the house. However, the project remained unfinished for budgetary reasons. The project was designed in a highly seismic zone and was shaken by the region's very arid climate. The project required complex technical solutions that were well beyond the owner's means. Now, the project for uh, Cité de la Musique in Paris, which actually was built by Christian de Portson Park, but I find the, the project by uh, uh, Yanis Xenaki is much more interesting and engaging. Too bad I can't read what is written here, uh, but uh, a remarkable project. The, the Cité de la Musique in the Parc de la Villette in Paris was part of the great works under the presidency of François Mitterrand. In 1983, Xenakis invited as a member of the jury to participate in the architectural competition for this new cultural complex, turned down the invitation by presenting himself as an architect. He co-signed the project to Jean-Louis Verret, a former colleague from Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier years, the topic of the competition was wide, about 25,000 square meters for the Conservatory of Music and then several concert halls, a large amphitheater exhibition halls. The heart of the Xenakis very proposal lied in the concert hall, which took the form of a patatoid on an elliptical plane. Designed as a lottery, lottery instrument, I don't know what this is, its generous curvature provided rich reverberations and avoided the need for sub subsequent co correction by acoustic panels, often found in halls of this type. The hall itself was enveloped by thin reinforced concrete walls, taking the shape of an inverted tulip. In reality, this floral shape was the result of the intersection of several hyperbolic paraboloids. The volume of air between the veil and the room was adjustable by pivoting panels in the walls, allowing the sound energy to be adjusted according to the piece programmed or the instruments used. Inside the hall, the floor was entirely adjustable according to the works and the public to be accommodated with small islands that go up or down. A spiral ramp anyway, sorry for this long, uh, long text. Uh, trying to be, describe uh, a project which was not built. 
The undulating glass panel, which we know already uh, covered uh, certain facades of the complex, the proposal passed the first phase of the competition, but was not selected for the second. From there on, from then on, Xenakis renounced all publicly funded architectural projects, including the new polytops. Finally, the proposal of Christian de Portson Park won the competition. But uh, this is a model of the of the of, of the project, and I really regret uh, it was not built because uh, this drawing gives me uh, <laughs> gives me a desire to see it built. But it was not built. What can we do? He tried. A family house in Paris that is for his own daughter. Uh, it, you recognize now his signature, uh, you know, work with the windows. Um, uh, Maki Xanaki is the composer's daughter and her, her husband, David Klatzman, wanted to extend their house located in Paris 13th arrondissement. Around the garden, Xenakis converted the facades on the ground floor and the studio by setting up undulatory glass pans. In the living room of the main part of the house, he also designed a circular zenithal channel light from the terrace of the first floor, uh, the first floor. And now this is the last work. No, it's not the last one, but this is the house he built for his own family. I found it named Tower in Corsica. This is the house that uh, Xenakis built for uh, himself and his family. Let's read the Kenakis, Xenakis family spend, spend, spent all their summer vacations in Corsica. A tent and a kayak were enough to discover the wild beauty of the island, which looked like the native Greece of the, ar of the architect. In the middle of the 1960s, they bought a ruined sheepfold that Xenakis furnished in a Spartan style to stay there in the summer. In 1996, as the family became larger, the architect composer presented his wife with a design for a brand new house on the same lot. <clears throat> the walls of two independent floors on an elliptical plan are completely covered with undulating glass panels, which are connected to the outside by a staircase. At the top of the letter, a roof terrace offers day and night a clear view towards the sky and the sea. A local architect, Jacques Colonna d'Istria, was responsible for its construction. And this is the building for the Xenakis, uh, Xenakis family in Corsica. And now we arrive at the last work I show, a uh, remarkable preoccupation on the side of Yanis Xenakis, cosmogonies in sound and architecture, the polytops. First, I show the diatop, diatop, the Bobur uh, polytop that he built in Paris in 1978. And here it is in front of Centre Georges Pompidou. Now, not everybody is allowed to build there. You can be sure of it. And he was invited to build there. And it's much better than the, the atelier uh, built by Renzo Piano for uh, Constantin Brancusch, which is on the other side. Uh, yes, Yanis Xenakis in front of the work by Renzo Piano and Sir Richard Rogers uh, and Peter Rice, the great uh, genius of structures. I don't know the theory behind it, but it is through such buildings that Xenakis explored both architecture and music. And, and the architecture, we have to confess, is, is, uh, is, is truly remarkable and innovative by today's standards also. Bravo to him. Polytop, diatop the Boburg polytop and some view from the inside. I don't know exactly what was supposed to go on here. I guess some sound uh, experiments. 
I love experimental art, experimental architecture, where these people push forward the frontiers. They refuse to follow the prescribed paths and they invent new things. Even the drawing, I don't know what it represents. It doesn't quite connect with what I showed before, although I discovered it on websites dealing with polytops. But even the drawing is beautiful. It reminds me a little bit of Lionel Feininger and then even Paul Klee the masters of the Bauhaus and the projection inside. Without knowing anything about it, I still appreciate it uh, visually because it has a fresh modernity. And now in 2022, last year, that is when it was the Xenakis centennial, we read this text, <laughs> discover Xenakis universe do, during a special event, uh, evening event at the BPI. I don't know what that is. In 1978, the composer and architect Yanis Xenakis was commissioned to create a polytope, which we saw, for the inauguration of the Centre Pompidou, a new cultural center in the heart of Paris. Diatop was installed on the pla on Place Georges Pompidou until 1979. Xenakis composed a masterpiece of LA electroacoustic music, The Legend of Air for this monumental structure. On the occasion of Xenakis centen centenary or centennial, IRCAM and uh, BPI, um, I don't know what this is, maybe a bank or something, are organizing a special evening in homage to this work, connecting the history of the center of architecture and of contemporary music. On the program, meetings with specialists, a presentation of IRCAM archives, a listening session, for La Légion d'Air and the presentation of models freely inspired by diatope or diatope, diatope, I don't know, created by architecture student, students at the Ecole Nationale d'Architecture de Versailles. This evening can be followed, you know, the text refers to a present which now became a past, can be followed by or associated with a showing of polytope in the Espace de Projection at IRCAM at 9 p.m. Reservations suggested. And now I end this uh, imperfect and in a way rather long uh, presentation on Yanis Xenakis with a drawing that, that I find uh, uh, very inspiring. And I wrote here a remarkable thought process expressed graphically. What do we see here? We see that fog in which most of us, if not all of us, find ourselves sometimes in our lives, not knowing where to go. And yet, and yet there seems to be the spontaneous order that scientists discovered in nature. I find this truly remarkable because again, this was an engineer. This was a lover and a knowledgeable man of mathematics. But what do we see here? Can you believe an engineer and a mathematician to draw something like this is probably some kind of a quest for a musical piece. Plenty of numbers which are uh, uh, coagulating themselves in a cloud uh, of uh, graphic uh, indecision. Uh, I, I mean, I see emotion invested into a, into a, into a uh, notation which could be musical more than architectural, but nevertheless, you would not expect a musical sheet to look like this. Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. In my opinion, it shows genius. This, this work just by itself shows genius. Sorry for the, the exalted uh, words. I love it. I wish I had it to put it on the wall. And this is the, I guess I took it, I forgot. Anyway, it's the website <clears throat> that uh, contains a lot of information about the polytops of Yanis Xenakis, cosmogonies in sound and architecture. Thank you. And uh, happy birthday, Yanis uh, Xenakis. We are grateful to you. <laughs>